Number 7. Flordelis Dos Santos In 2019, a former evangelical Christian singer and pastor named Flordelis Dos Santos was elected to represent Rio de Janeiro in the Brazilian government's Chamber of Deputies. On June the 16th of that same year, Dos Santos' husband, Anderson do Carmo, was fatally shot over 30 times outside their home in the city of Niteroi. The 60-year-old politician, who was with her husband at the time of his murder, wasn't injured in the shooting. Investigators subsequently determined that do Carmo's killer was one of the couple's four biological children, Flavio dos Santos. The gun he'd used to execute his father had reportedly been purchased by Lucos dos Santos, one of the couple's 51 adopted children. They both ultimately pleaded guilty to murder charges. In August of 2020, however, more dramatic details were discovered regarding do Carmo's death. The authorities came to the conclusion that Flordelis had been involved in orchestrating the murder herself, and several more of her children were implicated in the plot as well. She was formally charged on August 24, the same day law enforcement officials took five of her adopted children, two of her biological children, and one of her grandchildren into custody in connection to the deadly incident. Police suggested that Flordelis had been motivated to kill her husband by a struggle for power and the prospect of her financial emancipation. According to Brazilian digital news outlet G1, the politician had attempted to fatally poison Do Carmo on several occasions, starting in 2018, which had resulted in a number of hospital visits for him. In June of 2021, the Ethics Council of Brazil and the Chamber Floor voted to remove Flordelis from her political office and she was thus stripped of her parliamentary immunity. Number 6. Gregory Scott Hopkins On September 1, 1979, Catherine Janet Walsh was found dead inside her home in the western Pennsylvania town of Monaca. The 23-year-old's father had reportedly been unable to reach her over Labor Day weekend and consequently went to her apartment. It was there that he stumbled upon his daughter's body bound and strangled in her bed. Walsh, who was working for a refrigerator company at the time of her death, had no children and lived alone in an apartment owned by her parents. The murder case subsequently went cold for roughly three decades. In 2010, a state police serologist found new DNA evidence on Walsh's nightgown, the rope that had been used to bind her hands, and the bedsheet that had been placed over her body. Investigators were able to positively match the forensic evidence with the DNA of a Bridgewater Borough councillor named Gregory Scott Hopkins. It later emerged that Hopkins had been in a casual romantic relationship with Walsh at the time of her killing. He was ultimately convicted of third-degree murder in November of 2013 and consequently sentenced to serve 8 to 16 years in prison. In April of 2020, it was reported that Hopkins, who was by then in his mid-70s, had been granted a retrial by the Superior Court of Pennsylvania. As of the latest updates on the matter, it wasn't clear whether or not Hopkins' new trial was yet underway. Number 5. Alison Eichley Freeman On the morning of May the 22nd of 2020, Oklahoma State Senator Alison Eichley Freeman was traveling down the Turner Turnpike as she headed towards the Capitol building. At the time of her commute, the 29-year-old was reportedly driving recklessly at speeds of up to 91 miles per hour. And in conditions of heavy rain, Eichley Freeman ultimately lost control of her vehicle which then skidded across the rain-slicked road and crashed directly into a Chevy Camaro. The second vehicle was at the time stuck in a ditch after having veered off the roadway as well. The driver of the Camaro, later identified as 44-year-old Enrique Lopez, was killed on impact, while Eichley Freeman was left critically injured by the collision. Highway troopers later detailed how the state senator was trapped inside of her car for roughly 40 minutes before first responders extricated her from the wreckage and transported her to Oklahoma University Medical Center. Subsequent reports suggested that Eichley Freeman had largely recovered from her injuries. In November of 2020, she lost her re-election bid and less than a week later, she was charged with first-degree manslaughter in connection to the fatal car accident. Number 4. Efren Carrillo In the early morning hours of July the 13th of 2013, a woman from Santa Rosa, California, called the police to report that someone was attempting to break into her house. When officers arrived at the scene, they came upon Sonoma County Supervisor Efren Carrillo, who was reportedly wearing only socks and underwear while carrying a cell phone. The local politician was taken into custody on charges of prowling and burglary, 
but was released that same day after posting his $40,000 bail. The homeowner would later tell Sonoma County detectives that, on the night in question, she'd awoken to the sound of rustling on the blinds of her bedroom window and that she'd also heard a knock at her front door. Investigators found that the screen on the woman's bedroom window had been torn open by Carrillo as it attempted to gain access to the home in the wake of what was widely considered to have been an embarrassing incident. Carrillo publicly expressed his remorse over his actions. The politician attributed his bizarre behavior to the fact that he'd been drinking heavily on the night prior to the attempted break-in. He immediately checked himself into an alcohol rehabilitation facility following his arrest, which had marked his second run-in with the law in the span of less than a year. In September of 2012, Carrillo was arrested for taking part in a brawl at a San Diego nightclub in which a man was seriously injured. He was charged with misdemeanor battery and disturbing the peace, but the case was later dropped. Number 3. Sean Cattle A political consultant from New Jersey was arrested after it was discovered that he'd solicited the services of two hitmen to murder his colleague in April of 2014. The court documents associated with the case didn't disclose the names of the victim or the suspects involved. However, the description of the situation that was provided by prosecutors reportedly matched the circumstances surrounding the 2014 death of 52-year-old Michael Galdieri, a longtime political operative who'd worked for Cattle's consulting group. It was previously assumed that Galdieri, who'd been arrested on drugs and weapons charges in 2007, had been killed during a drug-related dispute. In January of 2022, however, investigators were able to connect Cattle to the incident. The latter reportedly confessed to paying thousands of dollars for a pair of hitmen to carry out the fatal stabbing at the victim's Jersey City residence before setting the apartment ablaze in an effort to conceal any evidence of the murder. 44-year-old Cattle appeared in federal court via video conference and ultimately pleaded guilty to conspiracy to commit murder for hire. It was reported that the maximum penalty for his crime was life imprisonment and a $250,000 fine. Cattle was released from custody on a $1 million unsecured bond and he was subsequently ordered to remain inside his home until his criminal trial. Today's topic was requested by KPG Doxima, Christian Gooman, Stax the Hustler, Bal Bustos, and Ricardo Garcia. If you have any other topics you'd like to learn about, subscribe and let us know in the comments section below. Number 2. Rebecca Warren Michigan State Police received multiple reports of a car swerving perilously across the painted lines on Interstate 75 on the night of December the 26th of 2019. An officer patrolling the highway reportedly witnessed the vehicle in question veering onto the hard shoulder and making contact with a guardrail. The car was then pulled over and its driver, who identified herself as Rebecca Warren, a member of the Michigan House of Representatives, was given a field sobriety test. As was captured by the trooper's dash cam, Warren was unable to walk in a straight line and also unsuccessfully attempted to recite the alphabet. The politician reportedly told the officers that she was driving to her home in Ann Arbor after an event at the Renaissance Center in Detroit, at which she claimed to have consumed only two or three glasses of wine. Throughout her interaction with the state troopers, Warren boasted about her status within the community. She reportedly begged them not to take her into custody, claiming that doing so would end her career and go down as their most famous arrest. The lawmaker refused to consent to a breathalyzer test at the scene of the traffic stop, but two vials of her blood were eventually collected at a nearby hospital. It was ultimately determined that her blood alcohol level was 0.212, which is nearly three times the legal driving limit. Warren pleaded guilty to a reduced charge of misdemeanor driving while intoxicated and was consequently sentenced to one year of probation and 10 years of community service. Number 1. Mario Zelaya Mario Zelaya served as the director of the Honduran Institute for Social Security during the administration of President Porfirio Lobo from 2010 to 2014. While he was on a business trip to Chile, Zelaya reportedly became infatuated with a local woman named Natalia Kiyofari, age 28. He showered her with lavish gifts in an effort to impress her with his purported wealth. Zelaya allegedly vowed to help Kiyofari leave the Platinum Club in Santiago, where she worked as a high-class escort and exotic dancer. During the course of their relationship, which the Honduran politician kept secret from his wife and three children, Zelaya reportedly bought Kiyofari 
two apartments, a beachside property, two SUVs, as well as high-end perfumes, watches, and clothes. In addition to the opulent gifts, Zelaya was alleged to have given his mistress roughly $4,000 in cash on a monthly basis. Honduran authorities began investigating Zelaya's financial affairs in 2013. It was ultimately discovered that the politician had been siphoning money directly from the Institute for Social Security, which is reportedly granted an annual budget of approximately $165 million. In all, Zelaya had embezzled an estimated $300 million in federal funds, only a small portion of which ended up going to Kiyofadi. The latter, who'd become pregnant with Zelaya's child during their affair, was investigated as part of the corruption probe as well. She, however, maintained having had no knowledge of her lover's financial misdeeds. Zelaya went on the run in January of 2014, but following a seven-month-long manhunt, he was tracked down and taken into custody on charges of fraud, bribery, abuse of public funds, and money laundering. Number 7. Valerie Cincinelli In May of 2019, a New York police officer was arrested after it emerged that she'd attempted to orchestrate her estranged husband's murder. The FBI had reportedly been tipped off about 34-year-old Valerie Cincinelli's sinister plot by the woman's boyfriend, John DeRuba. According to a federal criminal complaint, Cincinelli, a 12-year veteran of the NYPD, had approached DeRuba in February. She'd expressed an intention of hiring a hitman to kill Isaiah Carvalho, with whom she'd been embroiled in a contentious divorce and custody battle. The officer also reportedly sought to eliminate her boyfriend's teenage daughter, who was only identified in court records as Jane Doe. Cincinelli allegedly paid Deruba $7,000 after he claimed to have found someone willing to carry out the murders for that amount. As part of a sting operation organized by federal investigators, the police were sent to Cincinelli's home in Oceanside, Long Island, on the morning of May the 17th to notify her that her husband had been murdered. Shortly thereafter, Cincinelli received a text message from an FBI agent posing as the hitman Deruba had supposedly hired. The agent instructed her to wire an additional $3,000 as payment for the hit on Deruba's daughter. Later that same day, law enforcement officials took Cincinelli into custody and she was charged with conspiracy to commit murder. She was subsequently held without bail in Central Islip in October of 2021. It was reported that the former NYPD officer had been sentenced to four years in federal prison as part of a plea deal with prosecutors. Number 6. Newman Raja In the early morning hours of October the 18th of 2015, Corey Jones's car broke down on a highway exit ramp in Palm Beach Gardens, Florida. The 31-year-old was heading home after, on the previous night, his band had performed at Johnny Mango's Tiki Bar and Grill in the town of Jupiter. Jones was awaiting the arrival of a tow truck off Interstate 99 when a plainclothes police officer named Newman Raja noticed his disabled vehicle and approached it in an unmarked white van. Jones, who was armed with a firearm for which he had a concealed carry license, reportedly confronted Raja, whom he believed to be a burglar. The officer then discharged a total of six shots in the motorist's direction. Jones was hit with three bullets, one of which fatally pierced his aorta. Raja, who'd been doing burglary surveillance on the night later, claimed to have been under the impression that Jones was a carjacker. In court, Raja maintained that he'd identified himself as a police officer before firing his gun. His claims were refuted after investigators reviewed a recording of the officer's conversation with Jones, which had been extracted from the victim's cell phone. Not only had Raja neglected to identify himself as a member of law enforcement, he also reportedly hadn't been wearing the designated police vest that his supervisor had instructed him to put on while performing burglary surveillance. Following his criminal trial, Raja was convicted of manslaughter by culpable negligence and attempted first-degree murder with a firearm. He was ultimately sentenced to 25 years in prison. Number 5. Matthew Kinney at about 2 p.m. on May the 19th of 2019, a boy from Lafayette County, Mississippi, made the horrific discovery that his mother, 32-year-old Dominique Clayton, had been fatally shot in her sleep. It was quickly determined that the mother of four had been murdered by an Oxford police officer named Matthew Kinney, who was arrested the following day. During the investigation that followed the shooting, a connection was found between the victim 
and her killer. It emerged that Kinney, who was married with children at the time, had been having an affair with Clayton. As his shift was nearing his end on May the 19th, the officer reportedly drove his marked police cruiser to Clayton's house and broke in. To find that the woman was asleep, he went back to his car and retrieved his Glock 9mm handgun, which he then used to shoot her in the back of the head. Clayton's family later revealed to investigators that she'd become afraid of Kinney and worried he might harm her after she'd told him she might be pregnant. Another version of the underlying motive suggested that Clayton had threatened to divulge the details of their relationship to Kinney's wife after he'd attempted to break up with her. Although prosecutors had initially pursued the death penalty, Kinney was ultimately sentenced to life in prison after reaching a plea deal. Number 4. Henry Solis Henry Solis, a probationary officer for the Los Angeles Police Department, got into a heated argument with a man at a bar in downtown Pomona, California, on March the 13th of 2015, after the man, later identified as 23-year-old Salome Rodriguez, had left the establishment, Solis reportedly followed him on foot. The officer, who was off duty at the time, then fatally shot him multiple times. Solis subsequently fled to the Paso del Norte border crossing in Texas, from where he was escorted into Mexico by his father via a pedestrian bridge. Solis remained in hiding for roughly two months until he was eventually tracked down by the authorities. He was arrested and charged with second-degree murder. During his consequent trial, Solis claimed to have been acting in self-defense when he'd shot Rodriguez, a contention that the jury assigned to his case ultimately rejected. In February of 2020, Solis was convicted of murder and later sentenced to 40 years to life in prison. His father was charged with making a false statement to law enforcement after it was discovered that he'd lied about helping his son flee the country. He was sentenced to three years of probation and ordered to pay a thousand dollar fine. Number 3. Rosemary and Lovu South African police constable Rosemary and Lovu was taken into custody in 2018 following the revelation that she had attempted to orchestrate the murder of her sister. Prior to her arrest, Ndlovu had reportedly been a well-respected member of the South African Police Service, having risen to the rank of sergeant while posted at the Tembisa Precinct Station. The officer's murderous scheme was exposed by an undercover officer whom Ndlovu had unwittingly hired as a hitman. She was caught on tape enlisting the latter and another man to burn her sister, Joyce, and her five children to death inside their house. And Lovu had allegedly hoped the fire would be viewed as an accident, allowing her to collect the large amount of insurance money that would subsequently be paid out. It soon emerged that the sergeant had previously hired hitmen to carry out the killings of her living partner and five of her own relatives, all of whom had been murdered at various points between 2012 and 2018. And Lovu was reportedly living lavishly off the insurance payouts from policies she'd taken out on the victims. According to the South African media outlet News24, the officer had pocketed nearly a million dollars after cashing in on her family's life and funeral insurance. In November of 2021, Endlovo was sentenced to six concurrent life sentences by the South Gauteng High Court in Johannesburg. Number 2. Wayne Cousins Shortly after 9.30 p.m. on March 3rd of 2021, marketing executive Sarah Everard, aged 33, was arrested by a Metropolitan Police officer in Clapham, South London. The officer, identified as 48-year-old Wayne Cousins, had reportedly stopped the woman on the street as she was walking home from a friend's house. He then proceeded to handcuff her under the false pretense that she'd violated local COVID-19 guidelines. Cousins then forced her into a white car that he'd rented only a few hours earlier. The officer's cell phone was later pinged in the village of Sibbetswold. The authorities would determine it to be the area where the officer had assaulted and fatally strangled Everard in the early morning hours of March the 4th. The victim's boyfriend contacted local law enforcement to report her missing later that day, and an investigation into her whereabouts was subsequently set into motion. Roughly a week later, Cousins was arrested on suspicion of kidnapping Everard. They'd been spotted together in CCTV footage, corresponding to the night of her disappearance. The following day, the police found human remains in Hodes Wood, near Ashford, and a medical examiner was subsequently able to identify the body as Everard by her dental records. 
Cousins had allegedly burned the victim's body in the refrigerator before disposing of the remains in a pond near the woods where she was found. The officer pleaded guilty to Everard's murder and on September the 29th, he was given a whole life sentence, which is the most severe punishment possible under British law. Number 1. Daniel Holtzclaw After completing his shift, 27-year-old Daniel Holtzclaw, an officer for the Oklahoma City Police Department, drove his assigned police car back to his residence on the morning of June the 18th of 2014. Even though the officer was off duty at the time, he reportedly initiated a traffic stop while on his way home. The driver he'd pulled over was later named as Janine Ligons, aged 57. Holtzclaw chose not to report the traffic stop to police dispatch and didn't run a background check on the driver, as standard procedure dictated. Instead, the officer reportedly forced Ligons to engage in intimate relations with him. The woman would later tell investigators that she'd feared for her life and had desperately pleaded with Holtzclaw to stop the assault. The officer eventually left the scene without causing any further harm to Ligons, who promptly filed an incident report with the OKCPD. The following day, Holtzclaw was pulled aside during his afternoon shift at the Spring Lake Division Police Station. He was subsequently interrogated for two hours by detectives Kim Davis and Rocky Gregory. Holtzclaw vehemently denied the accusations levied against him by Ligons, but he was placed on paid administrative leave, pending a more thorough investigation. Eventually, the detectives learned that Ligons had not been Holtzclaw's first assault victim. In all, investigators brought together 13 women who were willing to testify that the officer had abused them in a manner similar to the way he'd preyed on Ligons. Holtzclaw had reportedly targeted an impoverished area of Oklahoma City, where he would initiate unreported traffic stops. He then allegedly ran record checks to find information that could be used to coerce prospective victims into having non-consensual relations with him. Following his criminal trial, Holtzclaw pleaded guilty to 18 of his 36 charges and was ultimately sentenced to 263 years in federal prison. Number 7. Joe Brown The star of the hit reality court show, Judge Joe Brown, was arrested on March the 24th of 2014 and charged with five counts of contempt of court. In addition to regularly appearing on television during his series' run of 15 seasons, Brown formerly served as a criminal court judge in Shelby County, Tennessee. As a favor to an acquaintance, Brown had agreed to review a child support case being presided over by Magistrate Harold Horn. According to Horn's account of the incident, Brown grew increasingly hostile towards the magistrate after he refused to discuss ancillary details of the case that were not written in the schedule. Brown repeatedly shouted at Horn and challenged his judicial authority. The outburst resulted in the former TV judge being sentenced to five days in jail at the Shelby County Corrections Facility in Memphis. Brown's behavior proved detrimental on a grander scale as his arrest occurred during his campaign for the county's district attorney position. He went on to lose the general election to the Republican incumbent, earning just 35% of the vote. Number 6. Jessica O'Brien Jessica O'Brien stepped down from her position on the Circuit Court of Cook County, Illinois, after it emerged that she'd committed mortgage fraud during her career as a realtor. O'Brien had owned and operated a real estate company for a number of years prior to her judicial election. In November of 2012, the 51-year-old had risen to prominence as the first Filipina judge elected in Cook County's history. Her husband, Brendan, was a fellow circuit judge, and the couple were well-respected within their community. According to O'Brien's 2017 indictment, the judge and her former business partner, Maria Bartko, had exaggerated their company's sales numbers in an effort to fraudulently obtain mortgages on two properties in the city of Chicago in 2004 and 2006. The inflated figures that O'Brien put on her mortgage applications ultimately defrauded her lenders of $1.4 million. She was brought to trial on bank and mortgage fraud charges and convicted of her crimes in February of 2018. O'Brien appeared remorseful during her court proceedings, tearfully shouting, I'm an embarrassment at one point in the trial. Despite her apparent contrition and her cries for leniency from the federal judge in charge of her case, she was ultimately sentenced to a year and one day in prison. In the wake of her conviction, O'Brien formally resigned from the court. Number 5. Cynthia G. Impareto 
Cynthia G. Imparetto of Florida's 17th Circuit Court was arrested and charged with driving under the influence on November the 5th of 2013. On the night of her arrest, the call was made to 911, reporting an erratic driver who'd almost crashed their white Mercedes-Benz into multiple vehicles on the roadway. An hour later, a Broward County police officer initiated a traffic stop with Imperetto, who was driving a vehicle that matched the 911 caller's description. The officer had spotted Imperetto as she swerved and came perilously close to hitting a parked car and thus pulled her over. The circuit judge initially refused to follow the policeman's request for her to exit the vehicle, claiming she was going to call her attorney. She was unable to dial the numbers on her cell phone, however, and she then begrudgingly agreed to step out onto the sidewalk. The officer noted that Imperetto was visibly unstable as she made strenuous attempts to get out of the car, having to use the door to prop herself up. Imperetto refused to take a breathalyzer test, causing her driver's license to be suspended automatically. She pleaded not guilty to DUI charges in December of 2013, but was ultimately sentenced to 20 days of house arrest and a year of probation. The judge stopped presiding over criminal cases following her conviction, and in 2015, the Florida Judicial Qualifications Committee recommended she be given a 90-day suspension, as well as a $20,000 fine as a result of her DUI. While awaiting a final ruling by the Florida Supreme Court, Imparetto made the decision to resign in February of 2016. Number 4. Diane Vittori Caraballo A former Mahoning County Court judge was convicted of stealing hundreds of thousands of dollars from one of her deceased clients in June of 2019. 50-year-old Diane Vittori Caraballo of Youngstown, Ohio, was first elected as a Sebring Court judge in 2002 and was subsequently re-elected to the position in 2006 and 2012. In addition to her judicial responsibilities, Caraballo also operated a private law practice. One of her clients was Robert Sampson, whose will she drafted prior to his death in 2015. She then submitted an application to administer Sampson's estate, falsely claiming that he'd passed away without leaving a will. The court instead handed administrative duties over to Sampson's sister, Dolores Falgiani. Caraballo prepared Falgiani's will on November 3, 2015. Most of her estate was left to various friends and family members, while the rest of it was given to two animal charity organizations in the area. Falgiani ultimately passed away in March of 2016, at which point Caraballo filed an application to probate her deceased client's will. While reviewing Falgiani's estate, the judge reported the discovery of $20,000 in cash in the woman's home, which was then purportedly deposited into her estate. During the next two years, Caraballo filed reports of newly discovered assets on a number of occasions. With each report, the judge secretly siphoned varying amounts of money from her late client's fortune. In total, Caraballo stole $328,000 from Falgiani's estate, the full amount of which she was ordered to pay in restitution upon her conviction. She was also sentenced to 30 months in prison and three years of supervised release. Number 3. Timothy Nolan In 2018, a district judge from Campbell County, Kentucky, was found guilty on human trafficking charges and other related felonies. Timothy Nolan, aged 71, held his judicial office for nearly three decades, during the course of which he'd become well-known for his strict sentences and hardened courtroom demeanor. He was also a staunch political activist, having worked closely with Donald Trump's presidential campaign in 2016. The former judge became the focus of an investigation which revealed that he targeted a total of 19 young women over a period of many years, forcing them to perform intimate acts against their will. Nolan reportedly made his victims take sedatives so as to prevent them from resisting his advances. As per his predatory modus operandi, he would threaten to arrest them or evict them from their homes if they contacted law enforcement or refused to perform the acts he demanded. Nolan ultimately pleaded guilty to the 21 various charges levied against him in court. Although he attempted to prolong his trial by firing his attorney and threatening to withdraw his guilty plea, Nolan was eventually sentenced to the maximum prison term of 20 years and was also ordered to pay a fine of $100,000. Number 2. Lynn Rosenthal Florida Judge Lynn Rosenthal was taken into custody by police after she'd collided with a concrete median and struck a patrol car on the way to work. Rosenthal approached the judge's parking lot at the Broward County Courthouse shortly before 
9 a.m. on May the 27th of 2014. A deputy present at the scene witnessed the sitting judge driving erratically as she sideswiped a parked police car with her BMW. She kept driving, eventually crashing into the security gate near the entrance to the parking lot. She reversed her vehicle and hit the gate several more times. The deputy stopped her and requested she exit the car. Rosenthal was noticeably unsteady and struggled to step out onto the pavement. Her speech was slurred and she freely volunteered the information that she'd been involved in another crash earlier that morning. Rosenthal said that a truck had tried to run her off the road, causing her to collide with a median on the interstate. She claimed to have recorded the incident with her cell phone camera. Officers reviewed the footage Rosenthal had captured, only to discover that the judge had crashed into the divider due to her own inability to stay in a single lane and not because of any other vehicle. Although there was no alcohol found in Rosenthal's system, she did admit to taking an Ambien pill the night before her arrest. She was charged with a DUI and eventually resigned from the 17th Circuit Court in October of 2015. She was the third Broward County judge found guilty of driving under the influence within a six-month period after the convictions of Cynthia Impareto and Giselle Pollock. Number 1. John A. Westhafer On March the 4th of 1996, an innocent woman was wrongly convicted of murder and arson. She was sentenced to 60 years in prison by Circuit Judge John A. Westhafer of Decatur County, Indiana. Christine Bunch, who was 22 years old and pregnant at the time of her conviction, had survived a house fire which had engulfed her living trailer and taken the life of her son, Anthony. An investigation into the origins of the blaze was subsequently conducted by a state arson analyst named Brian Frank. He determined that the fire had been started at two separate locations within the mobile home and that a liquid accelerant such as kerosene or lighter fluid had helped spread the flames throughout the rest of the residence. Based on Frank's findings, which were corroborated by a federal forensic investigator, Bunch was arrested for igniting the deadly fire. At Bunch's 1996 trial, Judge Westhafer baselessly accused the woman of getting herself impregnated in order to avoid serious punishment. He insisted that she would not be the one to raise the child she was carrying before handing down the maximum prison sentence of 60 years. Bunch served more than 17 years behind bars before she was eventually exonerated of the crime. Investigators ascertained that the kerosene present in the home at the time of the fire could have been attributed to the kerosene-powered heater in the living room. As a result of this discovery, it was determined that the accelerant was not poured on the floor by Bunch as the prosecution had previously argued in court. West Hafer retired in January of 2012, just a few months prior to Bunch's release from prison. Number 7. La Rosa Maria Walker Asakir and Dwight Broom Palmer two high school basketball coaches at the Elite Scholars Academy in Jonesboro, Georgia, were criminally charged following the death of a student at basketball practice. Before she succumbed to heat stroke, 16-year-old Imani Bell was participating in a mandatory conditioning activity for the girls' basketball team on August the 13th of 2019. Outdoor temperatures had reached the upper 90s that day, and the area in which the school was located had been put under a heat advisory. In spite of the dangerous heat level, head coach La Rosa Maria Walker Asakir and her assistant coach Dwight Broom Palmer forced the players to continue their conditioning training outside. Bell was running up the steps of the bleachers when she suddenly indicated that she was under some sort of distress. She required physical assistance to walk during the final lap of the exercise. Shortly thereafter, the student athlete collapsed at the top of the stairs. The adults at the scene attempted to cool her down by dousing her in ice water, but Bell remained unresponsive. Paramedics arrived at the school within minutes, and Bell was taken to Southern Regional Medical Center, where she would later go into cardiac arrest. She was pronounced dead at 8.23 p.m., less than three hours after her initial collapse. Walker Asakir and Palmer faced charges of second-degree murder in connection to the incident. A local district policy requires schools to cancel outdoor athletic activities in the event that the heat index rises above 95 degrees Fahrenheit. On the day of Bell's passing, the heat index had swelled to 106. Number 6. Esther Stephen and Shelby Heistand, a pair of high school softball coaches from Portland, Indiana, were arrested following the fatal shooting of Shea Breyer, aged 31, on January the 12th of 2020. Esther Stephen, also 31, 
and Shelby Heistand, aged 18, conspired to carry out the murder while the former and Briar were in the midst of a heated legal battle over the custody of their child. The two women had first met up at a church in Fairview on the night the killing took place. They called Briar and made plans to pick him up at his home in Portland. Upon doing so, the three drove to a bridge on County Road 125 West. While on the bridge, Stephen distracted Briar long enough for Heiston to grab a 22 caliber rifle and shoot the man in the back. Briar was found lying in the middle of the road at approximately 2 a.m. and was subsequently transported to the hospital where he was later pronounced dead. Stephen and Heiston, who both served as coaches for the Fort Recovery High School softball team, were arrested two days later in connection to the shooting. Stephen reportedly told law enforcement that she'd become angry with the victim after he expressed an intention of establishing his paternity for the child they shared. Briar also allegedly petitioned for child custody, filed for parenting time and sought a name change for the child. Both suspects were ultimately sentenced to 55 years in prison for the murder. Number 5. Joyce Churchwell The volleyball coach at Berry Hill High School in Tulsa, Oklahoma, was taken into police custody after allegedly engaging in intimate relations with a male student and a former teacher. Joyce Churchwell, aged 40, first contacted the student via Snapchat in mid-2019, sending him explicit videos and photographs. The coach, along with the unidentified female teacher, then invited the student over to her house, claiming her husband was out of town at the time. The student would later admit to law enforcement that he subsequently went to Churchwell's residence and had intercourse with the two adult females. In January of 2020, a warrant for Churchwell's arrest was issued by Tulsa police. She turned herself in and was placed on a leave of absence by the Berry Hill School District. Investigators discovered that the coach had sent additional messages to another student who hadn't followed through in her office to meet up. Churchwell faced criminal charges as a result of the incident and her teaching certification was revoked by the Oklahoma State Board of Education. Number 4. Logalogoa Tevasu A member of the coaching staff for the Santa Rosa Junior College football team was sentenced to a lengthy prison term following a fatal DUI accident on a frequently circulated California roadway. On the evening of November the 5th of 2017, 35-year-old Logalagoa Tavasu was driving southbound down Lakeville Highway while under the influence of alcohol. The assistant football coach was reportedly swerving in and out of the painted lines, recklessly passing other vehicles in his 2006 Dodge Ram pickup truck. Tavasu's hazardous driving turned deadly when he crossed all the way over to the other side of the double yellow lines, moving directly into the path of oncoming northbound traffic. The drunk driver collided head-on with a 2015 Toyota Corolla being driven by Paulette Quiba, aged 21, a business student at Sonoma State University. The violent crash not only involved the vehicles driven by Tavasu and Quiba, but three additional cars as well. Emergency responders were dispatched to the scene and three of the individuals involved in the wreck were transported to Memorial Hospital. A total of five people suffered minor to moderate injuries while Quiba ultimately passed away from hers. She'd been driving to her home in Ronert Park after spending the night with family members. They'd been celebrating the 10th anniversary of their arrival in the United States from the Philippines. Tavasu's blood alcohol level was roughly three times the legal driving limit at the time of the accident, and in the aftermath, he was held on charges of murder and drunken driving. The former football coach would have faced the lesser charge of manslaughter for Quiba's death but he'd already been given a DUI conviction back in 2011. This caused his charge to be upgraded to second-degree murder, and a judge sentenced him to 15 years to life behind bars. Number 3. Hayley Renault A 23-year-old volleyball and basketball coach from Washington, Illinois, was arrested after it was discovered that she'd slept with a student. In 2018, Hayley Renault was chosen to become a member of the coaching staff for both the girls' volleyball and basketball teams at Washington Community High School. She'd previously been a standout athlete at the school herself, before going on to play basketball at Eureka College. On July the 29th of 2019, Renault resigned from her coaching roles after allegations surfaced that she'd used her position of authority to establish an inappropriate relationship 
with a Washington student. Local police arrested the former coach on August the 5th and she subsequently faced criminal charges in relation to her improper conduct. She was sentenced to 90 days in jail and two years of probation, during which she was ordered to perform an unspecified number of community service hours. Today's topic was requested by P. Calls, Mary Broom, Dove Master and Sea Witches on Rye. If you have any other topics you'd like to learn about, subscribe and let us know in the comments section below. Number 2. Taylor Boncal Taylor Boncal, age 22, was accused of maintaining an inappropriate intimate relationship with a high school student while she served as the coach of the school's track team. In 2017, Boncal was finishing up her teaching degree at Central Connecticut State University when she first came into contact with the 18-year-old male. As part of the requirements associated with her field of study, Boncal was a student teacher at Conard High School in West Hartford. The student with whom she would eventually strike up a relationship was in the social sciences class she taught. After graduating from her collegiate program, the Beacon Falls native was asked to join the school staff as an assistant track coach. The male student subsequently asked for Boncal's phone number and the two began dating in December of 2017. During the course of their involvement with one another, Boncal and the student reportedly had intercourse on multiple occasions with all of their meetings occurring outside of school property. The details of their relations were revealed to the school resource officer in West Hartford by an uninvolved student. Boncal was promptly fired by Conard High School and a warrant for her arrest was issued by the authorities, at which point she turned herself into the police. Rather unexpectedly, the parents of the male student claimed that he and Boncal were in love and consequently requested the former track coach not be prosecuted. While Boncal did initially face charges stemming from their relationship, she was admitted to a special rehabilitation program that resulted in the dismissal of all her charges. Number 1. Joseph Mills On September the 4th of 1981, 31-year-old Linda Patterson Slayton of Lakeland, Florida, was found dead in her apartment, with evidence indicating that she'd been fatally strangled. Nearly four decades later, investigators were able to use DNA analysis to identify Slayton's killer as her son's former football coach, Joseph Mills, who hadn't been on the initial list of suspects. According to documents from the original court proceedings, Slayton's son Tim, who was 12 at the time of the incident, had told police that Mills had driven him home from practice on September the 3rd, the day before his mother's murder. In an interview with law enforcement, Mills claimed to have had a brief conversation with Slayton after she came outside to thank him for giving Tim a ride. According to Mills, he then left the residence and never returned. DNA recovered from the crime scene didn't match anyone in criminal databases and the case subsequently went cold for 38 years. It wasn't until June of 2019 that police were finally able to name Coach Mills as the perpetrator of Slayton's killing. The positive identification was made by investigators through a process called genetic genealogy. Forensic analysts cross-reference DNA from a crime scene with public genealogy databases, which consist of DNA that has been voluntarily uploaded by members of the general population. In doing so, scientists at Parabon Nanolabs were able to select Mills as the most likely culprit of the decades-old crime. Upon confirming that Mills was responsible for the crime, Lakeland police took the 58-year-old into custody. Mills insisted that Slayton had died while the two were engaged in consensual intercourse, but evidence at the crime scene suggested otherwise, and he was charged with first-degree murder. Number 11. Caroline Jury On April the 4th of 2021, 28 year old Caroline Jury was arrested for snatching the crown from the new Miss Sri Lanka's head. Jury, who'd won the title in 2019 and was also the reigning Miss World at the time, claimed that 31 year old Pushpika de Silva didn't deserve the title because she was divorced. During the ceremony, which took place at Nelampakuna Mahinda Rajapaksa Theatre in Colombo, Jury yanked the crown from de Silva's head, leaving her with head injuries. She was charged with assault and arrested but was seen leaving a police station on April the 8th after being released on bail. De Silva needed hospital treatment after the incident and was given back the prize as the event organizers announced that she wasn't a divorcee. Because jury refused to make a public apology, Miss Sri Lanka 
was determined to take things to court. Following the incident, the woman resigned from her title of Miss World. Number 10. Madison Cox On May the 23rd of 2016, 17-year-old Madison Cox was arrested and charged for forging doctor's notes to skip class at her high school in South Carolina. A year prior, Cox had won most photogenic at the Miss South Carolina Teen International Beauty Pageant. The former beauty queen was allegedly caught counterfeiting slips from a chiropractic practice in Duncan named the Paris Family Chiropractic. According to police statements, Cox had stolen a notepad from the practice and penned the letters to cover her absence from class. However, the date she'd written on the slips could not be accounted for as the doctor's office was either closed on those days or Cox hadn't been registered as a visitor. Number 9. Laura Zuniga On December the 22nd of 2008, 23-year-old Mexican model Laura Zuniga was arrested along with seven suspected drug traffickers at a military checkpoint in Zapopan outside Guadalajara. They were traveling in two trucks filled with guns and ammunition as well as 16 cell phones and $53,300. One of the men in the group was identified as Hangel Orlando Garcia Urquiza, the brother of an alleged drug trafficker, and appeared to have been her boyfriend. Zuniga, a former preschool teacher, was due to represent Mexico in an upcoming international pageant after winning the Miss Sinaloa title in 2009. She told police that she was planning on traveling to Bolivia and Colombia to do some shopping. In a later interview for Radio Formula, Zuniga claimed to have been kidnapped by her boyfriend, Urquiza, and that she had no knowledge of his illegal activities. She was initially sentenced to 40 days in custody, but was released and charges against her were dropped, as there was no evidence that tied her to criminal activity. Her story inspired the 2011 film, Miss Bala. Number 8. Kendra Gill On August the 3rd of 2013, 18-year-old Kendra Gill was arrested in Utah for making and throwing potentially fatal bombs from a moving car. She was charged with felony bomb possession along with three other friends after driving around a suburban area and throwing plastic bottles filled with tin foil and toilet cleaner. Following the arrest, Gill expressed remorse and stepped down from her position as Miss Riverton. The former beauty queen and her friends had reportedly targeted other friends as a prank and claimed to have meant no harm. Although nobody got hurt, officials stated that the improvised bombs could have caused great injuries or even death. They were initially charged with possession of an explosive device, punishable by 1 to 15 years in prison. However, in September of 2013, the teenagers pleaded guilty to the reduced charges of attempted possession of chemical or incendiary devices and were required to complete 200 hours of community service. Number 7. Kia Hampton On May the 28th of 2017, 28-year-old Kia Hampton was arrested in Allen County, Ohio for bringing drugs onto government facility grounds. Hampton, who'd been crowned Miss Kentucky USA in 2010 as the first African-American woman to represent Kentucky in the competition, was caught smuggling 2.82 grams of marijuana into the Allen Correctional Institution in Lima. She was bringing the drugs to Jeremy Kelly, an inmate at the prison. Officers from the Ohio State Highway Patrol caught on to Hampton after listening to recorded phone calls. After gathering sufficient evidence, they warranted a cavity search and later reported that while the woman was interrogated, she reached into her pants leg and pushed out a marijuana-filled balloon to the floor. Although prosecutors pushed for a prison sentence, Hampton received probation following a hearing in March of 2018. Number 6. Laura Mojico Romero In February 2021, 25-year-old Laura Mojico Romero was detained in Huatusco, a city in the Mexican state of Veracruz, on accusations of being part of a kidnapping gang. Romero was originally from the city of San Juan Bautista Tuxtepec in Oaxaca and had won the Miss Oaxaca Regional Beauty Contest in 2018. The beauty queen faced up to 50 years in prison if proven guilty. She was captured along with three other women and five men 
after a sting operation held by personnel specialized in kidnapping. According to the latest update on the case, Romero and the seven other alleged kidnappers remained in custody for two months after the arrest. The investigation is ongoing. Number 5. Nikki Potit In August of 2020, 34-year-old American woman Brittany Nicole Potit was charged with two counts of serious assault for allegedly whipping her ex-boyfriend with a metal dog chain. The woman, who'd moved to Australia in 2014, was reported to have left gashes across the 43-year-old's back after flogging him inside their Sydney home. Police charged her with a second count of assault for also breaking the man's nose. Known by her nickname as Nikki, she had performed as a professional wrestler for Kingdom Wrestling Entertainment and was also crowned Miss Virginia USA in 2011. However, soon after, Nikki was forced to give back her crown after posting a picture of herself wearing it with the caption, Miss Alcoholic USA. Her accusations were adjourned to Burwood Local Court in September. Number 4. Oria Vasquez Rios On June 30, 2013, Puerto Rican woman Oria Vasquez Rios was arrested in Madrid by the Spanish National Police on accusations of conspiring to murder her estranged husband. The former Miss Puerto Rico Petite winner had been on the run for over seven years. On September the 23rd of 2005, Rios and Adam Joel and Hang, from whom she was finalizing a divorce, were leaving a nightclub together. After paying hitman Alex Babon $3 million to kill her husband, Rios lured Anne Hang to an agreed-upon spot in Old San Juan, where Babon stabbed and beat him to death. To hide her involvement, Rios claimed to have also suffered minor injuries during the attack and made it seem like a mugging gone wrong. Initially, authorities mistakenly arrested and jailed an innocent man for the assassination. Rios was not suspected until a subsequent independent FBI investigation found Pabon guilty for the murder in 2008. However, by that time, the former beauty queen had fled to Italy in 2006 and managed to stay in hiding until June of 2013. After being detained by the Spanish police while incarcerated, Rios became pregnant and had a baby. She then married the father in jail in an attempt to have the Spanish court prevent her extradition as being the mother of a Spanish citizen. However, only one month after giving birth, in September of 2015, she was extradited to Puerto Rico under FBI custody. Her trial was set to begin on August the 28th of 2017, but it was delayed until August the 21st of the following year. In October of 2018, Rios was found guilty of her indictment and sentenced to life in prison. Number 3. Adayen Matthias In September of 2012, 20-year-old beauty pageant contestant Adayen Matthias confessed about conspiring to murder Oliveira, aged 21, after losing to her during a Brazilian competition. Oliveira beat Matthias in the final round of the contest, which took place in Cariesica, Southeast Brazil, winning the chance to play a starring role in the music video of a popular local band. Craving recognition as a dancing duo, Matthias and her partner, Julia Messon Baston, plotted to kill Oliveira, hoping that eliminating her rival would gain Matthias the pageant prize. The 20-year-old also involved David Correa in the plot, her boyfriend at the time, convincing him to be the one to kill Oliveira as a proof of love. On September the 21st of 2012, just hours before the filming of the music video was due to take place, Oliveira was shot dead in a hotel garden by Correa. After the killing, he allegedly texted his girlfriend saying, now you can have some ham with your breakfast, where ham is believed to be Brazilian slang for dead body. Soon after, Matthias and Baston confessed to planning a killing and all three involved have been charged with first-degree murder. Today's topic was inspired by Lizzie Melizzi Johnny. If you have any other topics you'd like to learn about, subscribe and let us know in the comments section below. Number 2. Darlene Gentry In February of 2007, Darlene Gentry was found guilty of murdering her husband and sentenced to 60 years in prison. 
Born in Cameron, Texas, she was married to Keith Gentry, whom she'd met at Texas State Technical College. The former homecoming queen and Keith had been married for six years, when on the morning of November the 9th of 2005, Darlene called 911 for her husband. She told the operator that they hadn't slept together the night before and that when she'd gone into his room in the morning, she found him gurgling with pink foam around the mouth. She also stated that all his guns were gone and that their back door was open. When police arrived, they found Keith Gentry had been shot in the head but was still alive. However, there were no signs of forced entry around the house. The man was rushed to the hospital and while searching the area, police found a stack of weapons just outside the Gentry home. They also found it suspicious that Darlene, a registered nurse, had done nothing to help her husband. So they took her to the station for interrogation. An hour into the woman's interview, Keith was deemed brain dead. After taking Darlene to the hospital to sign papers that would take her husband off life support, officers returned her to the station, where they decided she was the prime murder suspect. Further investigations revealed that Darlene had shot Keith herself with a nine-shot, 22 caliber revolver his father had given him that she later disposed of in a pond. Number 1. Ruth Commande in May of 2018, 24-year-old Kenyan Ruth Kamande was sentenced to death for murdering her boyfriend, Fareed Mohammed, three years prior. While awaiting trial, Kamande won a beauty pageant in jail and was crowned Miss Langata Prison in Nairobi. After the verdict, she repeatedly tried to appeal the country's Supreme Court decision to sentence her to death, but her efforts proved fruitless. Mohammed's family reportedly requested a sentence to match the crime after Kamande had stabbed him 25 times with a kitchen knife. The Kenyan woman claimed that her boyfriend had tried to infect her with HIV. However, the judge accused her of manipulative behavior and showing no remorse after the brutal attack that had left her boyfriend's dead body drenched in blood. Number 6. Henry Ruggs III on November the 2nd of 2021, professional football player Henry Ruggs III was involved in a fiery car crash that resulted in the death of a 23-year-old woman and her dog. Prior to the fatal incident, Ruggs had been regarded as a promising young player, having been selected by the Las Vegas Raiders with the 12th overall pick of the 2020 NFL Draft. The 22-year-old man and his girlfriend, Kiara Kilgo Washington, had allegedly been seen drinking at a top golf location in Las Vegas on the eve of the accident. They reportedly left the venue around midnight. According to local police, Ruggs was traveling down the roadway at speeds of up to 156 miles per hour as he approached a Toyota RAV4 driven by Tina Tintor at approximately 3.40 a.m. The man slammed on his brakes in an attempt to avoid the imminent collision. Unfortunately, his Chevrolet Corvette Stingray had been traveling too fast for his preventative efforts to succeed and it plowed into Tintor's vehicle at 120 miles per hour. Rugg struck the SUV with such violent force that the woman's car immediately burst into flames, trapping her and her dog Max inside. The Clark County coroner later determined that Tintor burned to death while she was stuck in the flaming vehicle. Ruggs and Kilgo Washington were taken to the University Medical Center of Southern Nevada to be treated for the minor injuries they'd sustained during the crash. Doctors discovered that Ruggs' blood alcohol level was 0.161% at the time, which was more than twice the legal driving limit in the state of Nevada. Upon his release from the hospital, Ruggs was remanded into police custody and charged with felony counts of DUI resulted in death and reckless driving. He was released by the Las Vegas Raiders less than 24 hours after his arrest. The case's preliminary court hearing was scheduled for March the 10th of 2022. Number 5. Mylan Cyrus An Instagram influencer known to her followers as Mylan Cyrus was jailed in the aftermath of a drug raid at an Indonesian hotel in November of 2020. At the time of her arrest, Cyrus had amassed more than 1 million social media followers and was regarded as a role model by many within the transgender community. She and a male friend had been suspected of partaking in the use of illegal drugs, which prompted officers to raid the Pierce Hotel room in North Jakarta. Cyrus and her companion were reported as having crystallized methamphetamine in their possession and 
They were consequently taken into custody. Indonesian law enforcement's perceived mistreatment of Cyrus was met with outrage by her fans. They were particularly up in arms about the fact that she'd been placed in a men's detention facility at Tanjung Priok Port Police Station rather than in a women's cell. The local police chief defended the decision by claiming that she'd been placed in the detention area that corresponded with the sex written on her citizen's identity card, which identified her as male. Amidst mounting condemnation of the police's handling of the situation, the social media celebrity was moved to a private cell. The charges levied against Cyrus in connection to her drug possession carried a maximum penalty of four years in prison. Number 4. Stephanie Peterson A Florida school teacher was arrested in February of 2018 after it emerged that she'd engaged in intimate relations with a male student. 26-year-old Stephanie Peterson, who was married at the time, had been employed as a science teacher at New Smyrna Beach Middle School. The boy with whom she'd been involved eventually told his parents about their illicit affair and law enforcement officials subsequently launched an investigation into Peterson's activities. According to the student's testimony, Peterson had begun sending him explicit photographs of herself in November of 2017. The boy alleged that in the months that followed, the teacher drove to his house during the late evening hours on several occasions in order for them to spend time together without his parents' knowledge. Peterson was also accused of purchasing marijuana for the victim as well as other drug-related paraphernalia. Her position was by definition one of a role model, but the woman used her authority to manipulate the young boy into keeping their romantic involvement a secret. As their relationship continued, the student's school performance reportedly began to suffer, which prompted him to inform his parents about the affair and finally put an end to it. Following her arrest, Peterson was charged with two counts of lewd battery and one count of transmission of harmful materials to a minor, to which she pleaded guilty in October of 2018. She was sentenced to serve three years in prison and an additional two years under house arrest. Number 3. Lisa Nowak One of the astronauts that was on board the Discovery during its mission to space in 2006 was later dismissed from both NASA and the United States Navy for assaulting a love rival. Lisa Nowak had cultivated a successful career as an aerospace engineer and a naval flight officer in the years preceding her dismissal. During her time in the Navy, Nowak had been awarded the Defense Meritorious Service Medal, the Navy Commendation Medal, and the Navy Achievement Medal. In 1996, she was selected to be part of NASA Astronaut Group 16, qualifying as a robotics specialist. Nowak was thus responsible for operating the robotic arms of the Discovery during the STS-121 mission to the International Space Station in July of 2006. The following February, Nowak was involved in a violent altercation at Orlando International Airport. The conflict had allegedly been triggered by Nowak's jealousy towards a U.S. Air Force captain named Colleen Shipman. The latter had recently started a romantic relationship with astronaut William Euphelein, with whom Nowak herself had previously been involved. Nowak drove her husband's car a total of 900 miles from Houston to Orlando where she confronted Shipman at the airport. The former astronaut pounded on Shipman's car window and pleaded with her to open the door. The Air Force captain eventually rolled the window down a couple of inches, at which point Noak sprayed mace into the vehicle. Shipman then fled the scene and contacted the police. When officers arrived, they reportedly watched Noak dispose of a trash bag at a parking shuttle bus stop. It was later discovered that she'd brought latex gloves, a black wig, a BB gun and ammunition, pepper spray, a hooded trench coat, a power drill, and an 8-inch folding knife with her to Orlando. She was thereupon charged with attempted kidnapping, battery, attempted vehicle burglary with battery, and destruction of evidence. After agreeing to a plea deal, Nowak was sentenced to one year of probation. She was terminated from NASA and discharged from the Navy under other than honorable conditions as a consequence of the incident. Today's topic was requested by Tiago. If you have any other topics you'd like to learn about, subscribe and let us know in the comments section below. Number 2. Oscar Pistorius In February of 2013, a South African sprinter who had previously competed at both the Paralympic and Olympic Games was accused of murdering his girlfriend. Before his criminal charges put an end to his professional athletic career, Oscar Pistorius 
had become world famous for participating in and winning several international sprinting competitions. Having had both of his feet amputated as an infant due to a congenital defect, Pistorius eventually became a Paralympic champion in the summer of 2008. He was also the first amputee to earn a non-disabled world track medal at the 2011 World Championships in athletics. His role model status was further elevated the following year when he competed at the Summer Olympics, becoming the first double-leg amputee to do so. According to court records, Pistorius had been romantically involved with 29-year-old Reva Steenkamp for a period of three months before her death. In the early morning of February 14th of 2013, Pistorius reached for his gun and fired four rounds through a locked bathroom door at his Pretoria home. In his defense, he claimed to have acted under the belief that an intruder had barricaded themselves inside. The bullets ended up hitting Steenkamp, who'd gotten up during the night to use the restroom, and the injury she sustained ultimately proved fatal. Pistorius's ensuing murder trial was held at Pretoria High Court, where it was established that the former sprinter was, in fact, mentally stable at the time of the shooting and could therefore be held criminally responsible for his actions. On September the 12th of 2014, Pistorius was formally convicted of culpable homicide. He was initially sentenced to only five years in prison, but following a motion for a longer term by state prosecutors, the Supreme Court of Appeals increased the sentence to 15 years. Number 1. Aaron Hernandez Aaron Hernandez's burgeoning career in the NFL came to an abrupt end in 2013 when he was arrested and charged with the murder of his friend. Prior to his incarceration, Hernandez had come to be regarded as one of the premier tight ends in professional football while playing alongside quarterback Tom Brady for the New England Patriots. His prodigious athletic talent had been evident since his collegiate career, but many NFL teams were wary of selecting him in the draft due to off-the-field concerns regarding his personality and temperament. On June the 18th of 2013, police officers arrived at Hernandez's North Attleboro home. The police spent several hours searching the residence as part of their investigation into the fatal shooting of semi-professional football player Odin Lloyd, which had occurred the day before. Massachusetts State Police had obtained a search warrant for Hernandez's house after it emerged that he destroyed his home security system and hired a team of house cleaners on the same day authorities had located Lloyd's body at an industrial park roughly one mile away. On June the 26th, Hernandez was taken into custody and officially charged with first-degree murder and other weapons-related offenses. He was released by the Patriots 90 minutes after his arrest had become public. It was subsequently reported that Hernandez's DNA had been found at the murder scene. Following his criminal trial, the former professional athlete was convicted of all charges and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. During the case's court proceedings, Hernandez was also indicted for an unrelated double homicide which had taken place in 2012, but the additional charges were dismissed in 2017. Days after his acquittal, Hernandez was found dead in his prison cell, having reportedly hanged himself with a bedsheet. He was posthumously diagnosed with chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE, in connection to the routine head trauma he'd sustained while playing football. News of the diagnosis led to speculation that his medical condition might have been a factor in his erratic and violent behavior. Number 7. Kenneth Glasgow Reverend Kenneth Glasgow was charged with capital murder for his involvement in the fatal shooting of a 23-year-old woman. The half-brother of the famous Reverend Al Sharpton, Glasgow was a well-known human rights activist credited with founding a non-profit organization called the Ordinary People's Society. On the night of March the 25th of 2018, Glasgow had reportedly driven an acquaintance of his named Jamie Towns around the city of Dothan, Alabama, as he searched for his stolen car. The two men ultimately tracked the car down and discovered that it had been taken by Brunia Jennings. Towns fired multiple gunshots at Jennings, who was sitting in the driver's seat of the stolen vehicle. She suffered fatal injuries while Towns and Glasgow subsequently fled the scene. Even though it was Towns who'd pulled the trigger, Glasgow was also hit with capital murder charges. Alabama law imputes charges to individuals found to have aided or abetted in the execution of a crime. While Glasgow awaited his murder case's final determination in court, he was arrested again following a traffic stop in which he was found to be in possession of cocaine. 
The pastor allegedly tried to swallow a packet of illegal substances in order to conceal them from the policeman who'd pulled him over. As the officer attempted to remove the bag from the reverend's mouth, Glasgow bit down on his fingers. He was charged with possessing a controlled substance, assault, and tampering with evidence. In February of 2021, a grand jury ruled that there was insufficient evidence to convict Glasgow of capital murder, and those charges were dropped while his other offenses were still pending in court. Number 6. David Love The pastor at New Hope Baptist Church in Independence, Missouri, murdered his best friend in cold blood in order to hide his decade-long love affair with the victim's wife. Pastor David Love and his mistress, Teresa Stone, came up with a plot to kill each other's spouses and run away together with the life insurance money they'd subsequently collect. On March the 31st of 2010, they set their plan in motion. Love fatally shot Stone's husband, Randy, in the insurance office where the man worked. The victim had been the pastor's best friend and a longtime member of his church's congregation. Love even went on to deliver an emotional eulogy at Randy's funeral. The next step of the scheme involved Love breaking his own wife's neck and staging a car accident to conceal the murder. Before he had the chance to commit a second murder, however, investigators began piecing together the details behind Randy's death. They ultimately landed on Love and Stone as the likely culprits. Police uncovered the fact that Stone had recently suffered a miscarriage, despite her husband having undergone a vasectomy many years prior. They deduced that Stone was having an affair and that she'd called on her lover to help to eliminate her husband. Stone eventually confessed to her extramarital activities and revealed that it had been Love who'd killed her husband of 19 years. The pastor maintained his innocence, but after the evidence against him became indisputable, he was charged with first-degree murder. In November of 2011, he avoided the death penalty by taking a plea that reduced the charges down to second-degree murder. He was sentenced to life in prison while Stone was sentenced to eight years after pleading guilty to charges of conspiracy to commit murder. Number 5. Kenneth Copeland One of the most popular televangelists in the world publicly declared that he could cure his followers of COVID-19 and put an end to the pandemic altogether. He also encouraged viewers to continue paying tithes to his Fort Worth megachurch, even in the face of the economic crisis brought on by the outbreak. Kenneth Copeland is one of the most famous champions of the prosperity gospel, which supports the notion that God bestows material wealth upon those who are faithful in giving their money to the church. Copeland's net worth is estimated to be upwards of $300 million, largely as a result of the proceeds earned by his international ministry. He has long been criticized for his perceived misuse of church donations, having relied on his ministry's funds to purchase luxury mansions, private jets, and other personal indulgences. He faced further derision due to his behavior during the initial onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. In a televised sermon on March the 11th of 2020, Copeland told viewers to place their hands on their television sets so that he could permanently heal them of the disease. On March the 29th, Copeland claimed that he had executed judgment on COVID-19 and that the pandemic would come to an end as a result. During a sermon in April, in a video that was ridiculed online, he blew air out of his mouth in the direction of the camera, claiming to have blown the wind of God at the coronavirus. Copeland opened himself up to further criticism, as he'd also told members of his church who'd lost their jobs to continue paying their weekly tithe. Copeland's response to the pandemic was widely mocked, with many finding his statements dangerous, irresponsible, and to be minimizing the seriousness of the illness. Number 4. Jacob Malone 37-year-old Jacob Malone was accused of orchestrating a murder-for-hire plot while he was still incarcerated for a previous crime. Malone formerly served as the youth pastor at Calvary Fellowship Church in Downington, Pennsylvania. He eventually resigned from his position in November of 2015 after allegations had surfaced that Malone had abused a young woman who'd come to live with him and his wife. Church leaders learned of the assault, which had resulted in the victim getting pregnant, and Malone was consequently forced to step down. 
He pleaded guilty to the offense in 2017 and was sentenced to three to six years in prison by Judge Jacqueline Cody. While serving out his term, Malone reportedly asked fellow inmate Angelo Tomeo to murder both Judge Cody and the head pastor at the Fellowship Calvary, Harold Lee, who'd been a key witness in Malone's conviction. In exchange for carrying out the killings, Malone offered Tomeo over $5,000 but the latter turned him down and reported his proposal to detectives. Two months later, the former youth pastor approached yet another inmate with a similar proposition but was rejected once again. When investigators followed up on and confirmed Tomeo's claims about his former cellmate, Malone was ultimately charged with criminal homicide, aggravated assault, and terroristic threats. Number 3. Frederick Smith a pastor from Memphis, Tennessee, was arrested on felony theft charges after stealing the identity of a 77-year-old member of his church and using it to commit credit card fraud. The inception of Pastor Frederick Smith's scam dated back to May of 2015. Smith had asked Cleavy Williams, a founding member of the New Life Holiness Church congregation, to serve as a prayer leader on the church's motherboard. Williams was honored by Smith's request and enthusiastically accepted it. But the decision swiftly proved to be ill-fated. Smith claimed that he would need certain pieces of personal information from Williams in order to make her position official. He subsequently obtained a social security number, driver's license, and information from one of her utility bills. Not long after giving this sensitive information to the pastor, Williams began receiving credit card invoices, showing charges between $10,000 and $60,000. She hadn't any knowledge of the purchases detailed on the statements, nor had she applied for the credit cards being used in the first place. Williams confronted Smith over the fraudulent charges, and her pastor admitted to signing up for the credit cards by using the personal information he'd collected from the elderly woman. He was taken into custody by Memphis police but later released. Smith failed to show up to his scheduled court appearance the day following his release and instead took to Facebook to declare his innocence. It was reported that Smith also committed a traffic infraction while awaiting his day in court. The vehicle he was driving at the time had been registered under Cleavy Williams's address. Smith was ultimately indicted on charges of felony theft and identity theft. Today's topic was requested by Miss Pratt, Stebo, Black Gemini, and Cat with the Strap. If you have any other topics you'd like to learn about, subscribe and let us know in the comments section below. Number 2. Barry Minkow After masterminding one of the largest Ponzi schemes in history, Barry Minkow became a born-again Christian while serving out his 25-year prison sentence. As a result of his good behavior and apparent rehabilitation, he was granted an early release after just seven years served. During his incarceration, Minkow had become heavily involved in the prison's Christian ministry and had even taken biblical classes at Liberty University School of Lifelong Learning. Upon his release in 1995, he became the pastor of evangelism at a church in Chatsworth, California, also serving as the director of the church's Bible Institute. Two years later, Minkow was appointed as the head pastor at Community Bible Church in San Diego. In addition to his pastoral efforts, the infamous former convict also operated a for-profit investigative firm called the Fraud Discovery Institute, which worked to expose pyramid schemes and other forms of financial fraud. In an ironic twist, in March of 2011, Minkow pleaded guilty to insider trading in connection with his fraud discovery business and was sentenced to go back to prison for five years. Around the same time of his second conviction, rumors began circulating that Minkow had been defrauding members of his own church for some time. One elderly woman from the Community Bible Church claimed that the pastor had swindled her out of $300,000. A widower told investigators that Minkow had stolen $75,000 from him after claiming he would donate the money to a hospital in Sudan. Instead, Minkow directed much of the money given to the church towards helping to finance a movie about his life. He was sentenced to an additional five years as a result of his church-related scams. Minkow was ultimately released in June of 2019. Number 1. Matthew Phelps Matthew Phelps of North Carolina was working towards becoming a full-time pastor. Having studied missions and evangelism 
at Clare Creek Baptist Bible College in Kentucky. On September the 1st of 2017, however, his plans for the future came to an abrupt end as he was arrested for the brutal murder of his wife, 29-year-old Lauren. The aspiring pastor had placed a call to 911 in the middle of the night, claiming that he had awoken to find his wife dead on the bedroom floor. He told the operator that there was a bloody knife on the bed and that he believed it was he himself who had carried out the fatal stabbing. Phelps admitted to taking coracidin, cough and cold medicine to help him sleep, but had reportedly ingested far more than the recommended dosage that night. He later told police that it was his medicine-induced stupor that caused him to unknowingly kill his wife. After initially pleading not guilty, Phelps ultimately pleaded guilty to first-degree murder and was sentenced to spend the remainder of his life behind bars. Although Phelps blamed his wife's death on his own abuse of coruscidin, it was discovered in the case's legal proceedings that the couple's marriage had been fraught with rising tensions leading up to the incident. Phelps was allegedly spending more money than they could afford to lose and Lauren had consequently made plans to leave him. Additionally, it was revealed in court that Phelps had developed an obsession with the 2000 film American Psycho, which centers on a narcissistic man who is secretly a serial killer. Phelps had also expressed to a friend that he was curious what it would feel like to kill someone. The victim's autopsy indicated that she'd been stabbed a total of 123 times, including 44 cuts to her face and neck. Thanks for watching. Would you rather have to attend a two-hour church service every day of the week or have to brush your teeth once every hour you're awake? Let us know in the comments section below.